not picking on you, but you know, it, and I'm assuming this isn't from the discussion that we just had. So there's got to be some other people who have at least a small fundamental thing where they at least put something in writing to the board. We'd like to see this addressed. Then it becomes a point where you can go back to staff, you can go back to the provider, um, RESP, and say, hey, we don't have this covered properly in our policy, or it's not being acted on properly based on the policies that have been handed down. We want to make sure that we're consistent across the board on policy. Um, ours is the UPISD, the uh, Intermediate School District here. Yep. So. I did go from the teacher, when I didn't feel like this was being addressed, to the disciplinarian of the elementary and the principal of the elementary and discuss this with them. And at that point, I said, and the disciplinarian said, why has this not been told to me that this has been happening? And, that, and I said, well, I don't know. And they, they were looking at me as because that's the hat I had on. And they pulled out immediately the student handbook and made sure that it covered in there that's crossing all this line. Okay. And so I feel, and then at the last board meeting we were at, they did address that all areas were covered. And I said, even such and such, and they, they made sure that I knew this was not going to happen next year. So I felt like it was Oh, she's probably just taking care of you. Like, okay, but, but now, so here's a couple things to get paid, by the way. This is great. So here's a couple things to take away from that, okay? You had an issue that came up, regardless of what the issue is. The issue was resolved, or, and we talked about resolution versus closure, because it's two different issues, okay? The, the issue is resolved in terms of going forward by reference to a document that's external to the party. We have a student handbook. The student handbook tells us how to behave. The student handbook provides for us a sorting mechanism a way to sort how we behave in different circumstances that relate to students. So you have something that's resolved for next year that would govern the situation that's the question. Now the question is, and this is a really good question because you're wearing your mom hat, but you're also wearing a board member hat. And, and kudos to you for, for being clear that you're wearing your mom hat when you're talking about the issues. Um, but the issue that, that you're going to have personally and that the board is going to have potentially in other situations, because this is a great example of the types of day-to-day -day stuff Senator Schumer was uh, named Senator Popple. That was his nickname. You know why Chuck Schumer's nickname was Senator Popple? Chuck Schumer's nickname was Senator Popple because if there was a Popple anywhere in the five boroughs, Schumer was going to make sure it was filled. Um, that was the constituent service piece, right? So you're going to have these Popples come up in these types of issues. And I, I would urge you guys to think about the differentiation between resolving the issue and closure. This is the hardest thing for boards to get around, and this is a great issue that you guys raised. Many times, boards will resolve the issues, or you'll be able to resolve the issue with your management company or with your, with your operational team. But the, the magic that you guys as board members can have and that you can be working together is to have the people that have raised the issue feel like they've gotten to closure without inflicting a process, an ad hoc process on folks. So by having people write to the board or by you know convening committees to talk about something that's already been resolved, you know, you make a fuel to the fire and prevent closure from happening. Like sometimes my kids come home and things bad things happen at school to kids. Um, you know, I'm not talking about your situation, I'm talking about sometimes my kids, my kids want closure. They want me to intervene and somehow give them closure that, you know, somebody was, you know, my, my, my eight-year-old is notorious for this. You know, once she's she's got a friend. They have frenemies now at eight. Does everybody know what frenemies is? Okay. So they have frenemies now in second grade, right? And so my eight-year-old has a frenemy, and she comes home, and she wants me to give her closure about her frenemy. Now, my spouse, this is just different parenting styles, and both of them are legitimate. My spouse wants to run down the street and talk to frenemy's mom and get closure that way. Um, you know, and, and so we've been through different iterations, and we've talked about it. And so, you know, she's run down the street and talked to frenemy's mom and, and gotten some closure. So now we're trying a different approach, which is the eight-year-old is not going to get closure. She's going to have to do it. And, um, you know, we're not going to add fuel to the fire by creating a process that is going to make the eight-year-old, every time she deals with frenemy, um, you know, upset. So what are we going to do? The goal is... Claire, that's my daughter's name, you have to you know, moderate how you deal with your friend of me. Um, you're going to have bad days, you're going to have good days. The closure comes from the fact that we resolve the issue. Something to think about. And I think, you know, and that's, but I, 
you, that's a great resolution that you guys have brought to the parent issues that are looking this one. I mean, they're the ones that just grab you right by the bottom of your spine, right? Um, and, and you guys resolve that issue in a very adult way. So now the challenge is going to be, do we want closure on the issue? How do we come to that closure? And the way you get to closure this way will help you in other situations where you get to closure with staff issues. Staff issues are big too. How do you get closure with a staff issue when a teacher feels like he or she has been really mistreated? When most of the employment relationships and charters are at will, right? How do you get closure with the staff if you have to take personnel action against a teacher that's very popular because of things that only you know? You only you know and only you can know that you had to investigate this teacher for hitting a student. And you can't really broadcast that. So the staff's upset. How do you know? Um, you know, only you know that you had to investigate this teacher and you actually turned them over to Child Protective Services or something. And the staff's upset because the teacher's leaving and the teacher's getting the parents upset. How do you get closure with that? If your processes are arbitrary, you'll never come to closure. Your school will be a stirred up hornet's nest. If you have what you guys did, which was look at the student handbook and you've got an external document, an external way to govern your behavior, you create an external standard that we all agree to live by, and that standard's dynamic, right? It's not, it's not set in stone, then you get to closure by saying, here's what we do in this situation, um, and move forward on that basis. Thank you guys for going first, too. God bless you. Yeah. Next. Um, we have, we have a, an interesting dynamic here, because um, this school hasn't started up yet. This school's been around 20 years with its brand new board member, and then Doing. They're not, it's not 
you know, holy crap, why did we buy a building without a playground? Because I've had those. Mm -hmm. um, you, know, <laughs> and, and, you know, who's to blame for buying a building without a playground? Why do we have this asphalt parking lot? Um, things along those lines. Instead, you're saying, how do we engage constructively with their stakeholders? And the other thing that was really cool about what you said is, you have the board president and representatives from management. Um, assuming that the board president, you know, through your bylaws or the consensus of your board, has the ability to speak to which is the most constructive way to do it. You have one spokesperson. Um, as long as that spokesperson is speaking for the board from the perspective of what the board has already done and only the things that the board has a consensus around, right? Um, you know, you're doing you know, you're doing a bang of job. I mean, you know, Jason and I can come here. We completely strayed from the from the, um, you know, the way we do things at the institute, and completely like basically said, oh yeah, the institute, you know, we know that there are these scores, and we know that all kids can learn, but you know, we don't believe that test scores mean anything, right? I mean, we wouldn't be speaking for the institute. We would be, it would be our opinion, and you would be holding the institute accountable for an opinion that we expressed, and and that wouldn't be fair to the institute. It's the same thing with you guys as board members and as spokespeople for ESPs. We want to make sure that when we're making these statements out there, that we're making them from a body of common, commonly agreed upon principles and standards. And I'll give you another example. Let's say sometimes the store, the news, the news, the press will run with very negative stuff. Um, a teacher is indicted for. I, I had this happen. I've written the. I've actually written the press pieces for these types of things. Teacher is indicted for having a sexual relationship with a student, right? Um, the teacher is put on a leave, can't come back to the school. The problem is that there are due process protections for the student. The student has all of these protections, but there's also a criminal process that's underway that anything we say can get us in trouble. And I don't mean in trouble in terms of helping kids. Anything we say, if it causes a mistrial, could potentially send that teacher back into the classroom, maybe not with our students, but with somebody else's students. Anything we say can cause harm. The response always in those terrible situations where we want to say this is reprehensible behavior, and we might have an investigation that says it happened is, there's a criminal process that's underway, it would be premature for us to talk about or speculate about those potential results. It's not because we're cold hard people. We couch that in other things about what we do about safe classrooms. It's because anything we say can put a predator back in front of children until the process is done. And that's why we need discipline when we go through these types of things. So a board member might have specific knowledge. You might have knowledge because you know you are a, another teacher in the building. Um, you may disagree with the stance, but if a board member goes out there and says, I know this person did this, I know, and I've had this happen. I know this person did this because I was a victim of child sexual assault in the past, and the symptoms and signs are there. If that's the circumstance, you are potentially going to undo all of the benefit of having a united stance as a board, and you're potentially going to put a bad person in front of kids. I purposely picked the worst example I could possibly think of to illustrate the point of stepping out from being 105 to 107. It's a great solution to the problem. Yes. Um, kind of the same scenario they had. Brand new school, but been around the block for a few times. Uh, our school's been in existence for 15 years, and one of the biggest issues uh, that I can truly recall that we confronted uh, the period of time we were selling after school, and the biggest one of the biggest issues that popped up was change in the budget as it was coming from the state. Huh. There was all the rumors coming through the news, newspapers, and basically rumors were starting to spread around the school about teachers were going to lose jobs, uh, and it was getting pretty bad. And at that time, my youngest son was still there, so going in and out of the building a lot of times, and like Mr. Lewis, Mr. Lewis, what's going to happen? Uh, you know, we've heard this, we've heard that. It's like, look, no, 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 we're going to work on this, we're going to work on it. So what we did was, is uh, with the board, we sat down and with the board president of Power Hill, we set up mass meeting with everyone in the school. Uh, teachers, janitors, you work there, you're part of the meeting. And we empowered our CFO, as well as the treasurer of the board, to play with the numbers. 
if we lose X amount of money this year, if we lose even more this year, and basically ran it up to about a three year period to kind of see what the possibilities were. So during the course of the meeting which we had, we basically, uh, the board agreed, because we were like three-fourths of the way through the school year when this was going on. We basically told them, everything is as is, as is. Nobody's losing a job. But once we get all our figures, all our facts, then there will be a determination as to what's going to happen. Because as of right now, we don't know. We have no facts. It's a lot of speculation, speculation in any window, so we don't know. Now, it didn't necessarily come to fears, but basically we told them up to the end of the school year, everyone is still here. And throughout the summer, we should be able to work out something. Uh, basically, what <coughs> happened was is that, yes, there was a drop. It wasn't so drastic. We did not change anything. What we had to scale back on was couple of school programs, uh, change of budgets around, throw, throw some money instead of throwing it into the programs, maybe cut it in half, put it in the reserves, things along those that way in order to manage it. Because the one thing that we found out in some of the questions uh, that some of the people were asking is that you may find out on your own. When you talk about you got $20 million to play with, that doesn't mean $20 million for the school in general. You got to pay bills. And one thing we had that we found out during this meeting was that a lot of people were shocked by the basic point that I made to them. 70 to 80% of my budget pays you the bills. And if we cut that money, some bills don't change. Electric, water, mortgage, et cetera, et cetera. Where are we going to take it from? So we weren't happy, but there was more understanding. We calmed some fears, and maybe for a few we didn't. Uh, but over the course of, uh, from that point, we were, the rumor stopped. Uh, we made it to the end of the year, and the changes for the following year were minimal. So here's, here's the, the interesting thing about that, that kind of, I couldn't plan this better. This kind of goes back to what we were saying about, as we're planning, looking at something that's external. Um, what you did was, you didn't panic. You didn't panic. You didn't throw the horses overboard, um, you know, in the situation because you thought that bad things were going to happen. Because if you had done that, the canoe might have tipped over, right? So instead what you did was you worked on a budget. You worked on figuring out where things were. You maintained the status quo until you had better information. And as a board of management company, you had the discipline to stay that course. And that's, I think that's an important Thing. Sometimes we think that there's this crisis and all of a sudden, and I've had this, believe me, I work with a lot of deaths and districts, I, it's terrible. Um, you think that there's a crisis and you have to throw everybody overboard and you have to figure things out. I had a school district in a K-12 that decided they were short of money so they were going to end all of the special programs. Everything, art, music, everything was going out the door, middle of the year. Well, it turned out the budget information wasn't so accurate. And um, they were losing kids because they panicked, like you did not. They panicked. And they ended up losing kids because they panicked. They lost like 400 kids. And when you're a deficit school district, you lose 400 kids. That's a bite. Um, so they had to bring the special teachers back because they fired them mid-year. They laid them off mid-year. They had to bring the special teachers back. And guess what? For their trouble, they got to pay unemployment for the period of time that those teachers were employed. Um, and so the, the, the downside of panicking is you know you create more issues so yeah, that's great yeah. great great example next uh, you're up Hurtful <laughs> <laughs> well, is fairly new so they haven't had a lot of issues um, so that's good and then our school is older and we recently two years ago had to um, go through a new administration so um, you know relatively went smoothly um, hired somebody from within so um, we have been working through um, strategic planning we have new new board members so um, we're in a pretty good spot right now trying to focus for our future so, so you had to turn over the administration you decided we're going to address it by doing a strategic planning process we i think that that kind of put a new spotlight on that where we were before and just started kind of 
a fresh page and have some new board members and so that's helping us redirect maybe. Good. Right. Okay, this table? What do you got? <laughs> okay. Well, um, we, we're only been open two years and my colleagues here are new coming on board and a new board member. So, and we didn't have any really hot issues, uh, but a couple of things have been said that I think are really important. And one was, um, I will talk about one uh, student issue that we had and how we dealt with it. But we were able to, because at the very beginning when the board was, com was recruited, we had a common vision about what kind of a, a academy we wanted to run, that it was going to be uh, a zero reject school, that uh, we would welcome all who come, and once they come, we would never let them go for any reason. So that was a philosophy statement, and we believe that all people can learn. So that, that's a, a philosophy. Then I think other people have spoken to some things that are really great tools, your student handbook, your policy framework, because then you can go to that document that doesn't have a personality and probably <laughs> what to, uh, you know, the tool to work with. Uh, the issue that came up was um, a, a student uh, discipline issue, uh, which would, uh, it was uh, drugs and weapons, and under Michigan Zero Tolerance Law would have been shot and shot gone. Uh, which or a police report, which is worse. And um, instead, what we did was uh, we invoked that little line in the board policy that says in, in these, in these uh, zero tolerance situations, the board will have an opportunity to do it. <coughs> and so we convened as a board with the student's mother, the head of the school. I think that the head of the school really wanted an expulsion, but uh, to a person, the board said we don't uh, we don't separate students from learning. We will design a learning program for the students so that uh, that while the student may not be in this environment for for until September first, the student will never be away from his engagement and learning. And so that's going on now. And uh, but it couldn't have happened if there wasn't a common philosophy that everyone had subscribed to before we came, and it couldn't have gone so smoothly if we didn't have the policy framework and the student handbook. So just some tools to I hope we don't have more of them, but that's not too bad. You know, there's a nuance there that I, that I really want to highlight, and you kind of blaze through it, but I think it's really, it's key, um, what you guys did, which I think was great. The school leader signed on to a school that had a specific vision and mission. And there were policies that you could look at. The school leader, I, I do a lot of expulsions. The worst part of my job, really. Um, uh, kids do really boneheaded things. Boneheaded things. Um, and so, uh, <laughs> so the school leader signed up for this program. Um, the board is implementing the way program. They're implementing it in around a common vision that they were all attracted to and coalesced around. And the interesting thing is you use external documents, things that were created and did not change in the given situation. Probably, I'm guessing, to remind the school leader, school leaders always want an expulsion. I mean, right? I mean, they always do when they're in these types of situations. And zero tolerance, it's, they always do. And so the trick is, it's always a trick to say, how, how are we going to support the school leader while at the same time making sure that we, you know, we're, you know, we find the facts. Because sometimes I've had school leaders that want to expel kids for things that, you know, you look at the handbook. I had a school leader, a principal in the K-12 building that wanted to expel a kid because she was convinced that um, uh, the kid had infracted. Let me back up for a second. Let me address your issue and I'll add this hypothetical because I'll tell you how this can go bad real quick. You reminded the school leader from reference to external documents, what he or she had signed up for. And by reference to external documents, not by overriding him at the whim of the board or a board that went rogue, why you were not going to expel the child. So that's, again, the strategic planning process. What does our charter say? What do our policies say? Where is the exercise of our discretion within the charter and within the policies? If your policies or your charter didn't allow for that, 
or if the zero tolerance legislation didn't allow for that, you probably wouldn't have done it. You'd have been stuck expelling the kid. Um, regardless of where your values are, you still have external documents that govern what you do, and then trying to fix it from, from going forward. But you had an external document, an external thing that we all agreed on that kept everybody in their lane. So I had a, a, a special ed uh, student that uh, became the unwitting foil of a battle between two girls. One girl was swimming in the pool, uh, and she had stolen the boyfriend from another girl who was sitting in the bleachers of the pool at school. And the, um, uh, the girl that had lost her boyfriend that was sitting in the bleachers told the special ed child who was very highly, I, I don't know what her impairment was, but she was very highly suggestible, um, you go and you drown that B-I-T-C-H. And the girl did. She swam out and she held her down by the shoulders and tried to drown her. And um, the, uh, the student discipline that resulted was um, the school was urged by the police, who have a very, very different burden than school boards have, that everybody involved had to be expelled, except for the person who was being drowned. And the reason they had to be expelled currently, forever, and you know, we, you know, we burn the card and, and bury the ashes, was because the police were going to charge one of the students with attempted murder. Okay, well that's fine. Um, but we didn't have a handbook provision that talked about this, you know, in the school company. There wasn't a handbook provision that said that, um, you know, if you are just in the bleachers and you say to somebody else who's an independent actor, go and do this, right? This isn't law and order, right? Um, you know, this person, you know, made the statement, could not be certain the other person could do this, blah, blah, blah. She went and she sued the school district. Um, you know, the, the student that was the, that made the statement, go drown the BITCH, the other, the one that was in the bleachers, she went and sued the school district because she was expelled permanently and was carrying on her record that she's being expelled for attempted murder. I mean, come on, right? So the, there was no external document that could govern our behavior in those situations. There was nothing that could moderate how we were going to respond. And the response was out of whack um, compared to the behavior that was involved. Everybody got it. Um, the board tried to talk her out of it, but the board decided, well, we're going to support the administrator, and they supported her right into a lawsuit. Um, the point being, these are the reasons we look at things that are external. I mean, these are the reasons we try to apply rules and change the rules if we need to, but we change it by consensus. Okay, I'm sorry, that's enough preaching. Next. Um, so, uh, newer schools. Just been around two years, um, but really we've been long, around longer than that. So the, our conversation kind of focused around our actual transition from being a magnet school within a public school to becoming a charter school, and how that process um, occurred to end up forming the organization that we now have that's now birthed in other schools. And so, um, really, uh, what we were uh, the conversation focused around. How we uh, we had a loss of leadership, which then um, broke down into a loss of ability to continue to work with the public school system that we were part of, um, and then having to put together a board and uh, ESP and this whole school in a matter of four months. Um, and uh, so, uh, What's really, pardon? what school? You know, okay. You know, okay. That's right. Um, so the. Uh, Really, where to kind of get to the question of uh, um, what that all meant for us was uh, being able to have those open, um, very frank conversations with the ESP. In our situation, that was very easy for us because we had been working together for five years prior to that. And so the leadership team that was part of the magnet school broke into part becoming a board, part becoming an ESP, and there's a lot of mutual trust that exists there that we are now continuing to build on uh, and, uh, and be able to work with. So it's, uh, for us, the, the takeaway that, uh, that I guess I'm, I'm wanting to put in here is being able to openly have, uh, have those conversations with the ESP and being able to um, talk about situations um, long before they, uh, they arise and have that trust where we just know that um, uh, that we're, we're working from a very common mission. 
Uh, now, uh, down the road, I think that uh, as we become more operational and less foundational, that's going to change, and, and that's some of the stuff that we're starting to get into now. So how are you going to feed new board members that maybe weren't through that process? Where are you guys looking at? Uh, Zealand. Zealand, okay, how that, okay. So how are you going to feed new board members that may be from the environs around Zealand, but may not necessarily have you know, understood that founding questions that you had? Into oh. okay, <laughs> yeah, you know, you know, as, give us a, how did you do that? Are you a new board member? You know, when did board member of a birth separate school, a birth yeah. school. Okay, so, so now we're birthing schools, and so we're having to create new board members uh -huh. for these new birth schools, and so you know that's part of the conversations we've been having this weekend is okay, what does that look like? How do we start to have some of the board continuities that go with that? Um, because we have now have three more schools, that's three times the number of board members, four times the number of board members that we're getting to and, and how that all works and get some of that continuity. Um, and so yeah. So that's the interesting thing. I mean, as your kids grow up, they start to do things differently than usual. And these are separate boards that are separate governmental entities. With you know, this, this need to do things kind of their own way. And so I think what's going to be very interesting is how you guys, and this is the question of scale. It's like the unicorn. I mean, only the pure of heart can see a school that's truly scalable, right, I guess. Um, because how do you preserve the brand, preserve what makes Inno Academy unique, preserve all those things when new boards are going to confront new situations and potentially do things that don't take them on a completely different trajectory, but there's going to be the temptation to try to say, hey, wait a minute, we would have done things this way. Why didn't you do things the other way? So that's going to be really important to your strategic planning process. Um, God bless you. That's, but that's going to be a real, I think solving that question, answering that conundrum for yourself is going to be a real, um, is going to be a real game changer. That's great. Thank you for sharing. All right. What up? So sitting with, um, as a new member of a 14-year academy and new members of a newer academy, um, in our academy, really historically, no major issues until very recently. So you have a 14-year academy where things have been running really smoothly and suddenly my impression as a new member, wow, big thing, kind of out of the blue. And now in the process of tapping into our resources with LSSU and NCSI, of how do we move forward from something that's surprised us? It's not huge challenges necessarily in the beginning, and this is my impression as I'm a new member and asking a lot of questions about the history of the board. So we don't have, we aren't at a point to share a resolution of an issue that we've dealt with, but we're right in the middle of it. And my impression here is tap into your resources when you have issues. Tap into LSS issues. Tap, you know, I'm learning here, in fact, we joked several times with my fellow board member who's, who's left that we feel like this particular weekend was structured just for us. As we keep seeing it, subject matter for subject matter, we're like, oh, this is completely what we needed in order to take back, in order to really move through this process and create the level of communication that you talked about being correct, we have an issue. So how do we communicate that with these amazing teachers and team that we have in order that they aren't functioning in fear and they're functioning from knowledge and can build those trust factors that there's a board that's on their side and we're looking at the global aspects of what's happening and that's what we talked about too as founding members and then moving toward a more stable, not your huge growth curve, but as you as you level off and, and your growth slows if you will, or you're more stable to really be conscientious in the shift of how you really need to function. So I don't have no, success story, but um, we're in the middle of it and just doing our best to tap in to all the resources. No, that's a really good. There's a, anybody here familiar with Xenophon's Paradox? Xenophon's Paradox, wonderful. I got two paradoxes today, Stocktail and Xenophon. <laughs> Xenophon was a great philosopher. This goes to exactly what you're saying, by the way. It's a long way around. So Xenophon's Paradox is if you shoot an arrow at a target, it can never actually get to the target. Because in order to get to the target, there are an infinite number of points in space between the bow and the target. And so in order to get from point A to point B, it's got to go half the distance. In order to go half the distance, it's got to go half the distance that, you know, between those two points, it's got to go half the distance, and you reduce it, you know, out into the night. So the interesting thing I take away from what you're saying is, and, and I didn't think about it until you were framing it, um, 
as, as boards we tend, and, and maybe it's just the, having you two go right back to back. As boards, we tend to work sometimes in blissful isolation. Um, I'm lucky as an attorney, I've got this practice group that informs my practice that will tell me when I'm straying from, you know, whatever. And they'll, you know, they'll be pretty brutal about it and honest. Um, and it's great to have colleagues that are honest in, in, in that way. And so um, the interesting thing is, we think we're laboring in isolation, but we're really not. And if we keep going through these things and we think we're dealing with them for the first time, there's always going to be something you're dealing with for the first time. The arrow will never get to the target because you're always trying to cover half that distance. But there's this long arc between the bow and the target. And by not by having this kind of dialogue, by hearing what other folks are doing, by hearing what resources are out there, you're not going to get mired into in the way you're solving your problem. This is what I hear you saying. You're not going to get mired into, we're only going to solve a problem based on the knowledge that we have in this tiny little vessel. We're going to solve a problem with relation to, I talk about external factors, with relation to external resources, external perspectives, external opinions. And because they're external to the labor that we're doing in blissful isolation, we won't get so provincial in our solution and they'll help us inform the solution. They'll help us take the personalities out of the situation. They'll help us take the day-to-day -day stress out of the situation so we can give a, a resolution to everybody that's based on something that everybody can agree on. I mean, is that kind of a fair recap? I mean, I think that having those two back-to-back, -back, that's... All right, so I'm going to rocket through the rest. You guys have worked hard, by the way, in this. I appreciate it. I appreciate the candor from the board member who shared, you know, what her issue was, you know, to what you guys are saying about the bad press and the finances, all of this stuff. You guys have worked really hard. And, and, not going to go over time. I promise you, we're going to end at noon. But it means that I'm going to kind of take a little bit of the content out of the rest of the slides. Is that okay? All right. So um, using the tabletop exercises to help you that. Yeah. Okay. So one way to think about strategic planning is to do to figure the strategic plan in the larger context of building an organization that can sustain greatness. So what I've kind of brought through with you here is some of the exercises you know, that I would go through with boards that are beginning their strategic planning process, that are starting to look at things. I usually will break the strategic planning process. Different people have different ways to do it, but I'll usually break it into, I can't walk into your school and answer your question. I just can't do it. I can't walk into your school and deliver some silver bullet to whatever you know, is, is, is you're having difficulties with. The answers to our problems have to come from within ourselves. So I'll probably spend a goodly part of, you know, maybe half the morning trying to get folks to talk about how they perceive their organization moving forward and trying to establish some basic ground rules for how to do it. Um, and what I try to get at with that strategic planning process is, can we build around these four things? Discipline of people, discipline thought, and discipline action. Can we get to a place where we have a context that says, you know, we're not going to get mired into the details of this specific issue. I've got an example. I'm picking on our parents who isn't here anymore. But this specific issue, she didn't get mired into the details of, I want closure on this specific problem. She's got a resolution, and now she's trying to figure out, okay, what kind of follow-through do I need to make sure that the resolution sticks? You know, so you're not getting mired into the financial crisis. Oh, my God, we've got to reflexively you know, lay off half of our staff. You're going to have a follow-through that's going to allow you to identify the issue and identify it in a disciplined and methodical way. I tell you, as a lawyer, I see people in stress every day. I see people in, in the kind of existential stress that, um, you know, that, that just you may be able to imagine, but a lot of people can't. You know, businesses are going, you know, bad things have happened to kids, um, trying to deal with sustaining an organization that is, um, you know, that, that, that you know, they might lose the farm in litigation, um, I started out doing free legal aid um, in Wayne County uh, when I was in law school and uh, still do pro bono cases for personal protection orders. Um, personal protection orders are situations where you know somebody's doing bad things and you want them to stop. Um, these people are under stress that you would not be. And um, the point is that when we try to, to inform our practice or we try to do the strategic planning process, what we want to do is we want to take you out of that stressful situation. These are the types of stresses that we can resolve by looking at external factors. These are the types of stresses that we can resolve in a way that brings everybody together. They're not the types of stresses that are revolved by cutting heads off. 
and the, the, the desire, I mean, that, that you know, kind of limits my market strategic plan. If there's litigation, believe me, you know, we can do it. But I would much rather work with you guys, or much rather see you guys as boards, work with somebody that's going to that's gonna chart a path forward that everybody can be on if they want to be on. Believe me, the people that don't belong on the bus, they will self-select off. They will. And they'll self-select off because you will not be giving them the satisfaction of playing into their grudges or their, their weaknesses. They will. And you will be a stronger organization because of it. So the purpose is, look at discipline people, discipline thought, discipline action. What is it that we can agree on as goals for our organization? Um, and the charter and the policies are a phenomenal place to start. Mm -hmm. Um, the next one is planning and evaluation, which I'm going to race through. The point of these next bunch of slides, how do we plan, what do we evaluate, was to answer some of the questions about CMOs and EMOs. And I want to let you know that threaded through this entire concept of evaluation, we're going to do the next module in 15 minutes, um, threaded through, and we're going to have time for questions, um, threaded through this entire concept of evaluation is a new legislative bedrock principle that students will be evaluated based on growth. Surprisingly enough, if you have a full service management company or if you have a third party employment staffing company, behind the scenes what is happening is the staff and administrators, administrators, school leaders should be evaluated based on the statutory rubric that requires student growth in 2011-12 to have been a significant factor in the evaluation and I think it will be on the slides, you can test my recollection, by 2015 to be 50% of the evaluation. So student growth is an irreducible requirement of the evaluative process. Um, sample educational goals from an LSSU charter, which will remain nameless. Um, uh, Julie kind of covered how these goals look, but you know, you're going to evaluate your overall performance based on goals that are specifically identified, specific measures for the goals, what you're going to use to assess those goals, and what your targets are. These evaluation uh, pieces are in your charter under the educational program. They're readily accessible by you guys online at the LSSU website, which Jenny kind of reminded me um, was out there. Um, they're readily accessible online. You guys can read your own charter and see what you've agreed to produce for LSSU and what those goals are. But what's going on underneath those goals is um, What's going on underneath those goals is something that's very similar to the administrative evaluation process I laid out. I picked administrators because people don't realize that administrators are evaluated based on student growth as well. If you have an administrator that is making the grade for these, um, these student growth scores, you will be able to know by, with reference to the reports that your management company or your employer provides whether that administrator is highly effective, effective, minimally effective, or ineffective. You'll know, right? And because you'll know, you'll be able to inform decisions based on that. Is that administrator minimally effective because he or she hasn't been given the appropriate professional development? Has the administrator not been given the appropriate professional development because money is tight and we put a moratorium on professional development? Or has that administrator not been given appropriate professional development because whoever's overseeing the administrator doesn't have a clue that administrators are evaluated based on student growth until the last minute at the end of the school year. So administrative evaluations, teacher evaluations, staff evaluations, these are all driven in some cases by statute, in some cases by your charter, but what's the common thread with all of them? They're all external to your relationship with the operations team as a board. And you can use that as a ruler or a benchmark. You can take the personality right out. Okay? Um, Additional differences, uh, let's go with that. So the rest of the evaluation also deals with training and proficiency and using for administrators and using the evaluation tool with teachers. If you've got a building, I guarantee you, um, one of the school boards out here will have a building full of highly effective teachers. If you have a building full of highly effective teachers, they ain't gonna evaluate. I, I, I'm telling you, I mean, it just is. I mean, I've seen enough of these evaluations come. I've, I've litigated these evaluations over the last two years. If you have, they may be great people, they may be phenomenal teachers, but it's like the difference between good and great, you know, they, they, they're not being evaluated right. And part of this evaluation of the administrator is the honesty and the fidelity to the evaluation tool that's going into that evaluation process. 
and because student growth is such a big component, yeah. if your overall results of your school is mediocre, based on student growth, yet all your teacher evaluations are highly effective, sometimes not lined up. And Julie's going to be telling, you know, Julie's going to be telling the analysts, you folks, hey, you know, these things don't square, maybe you ought to take another look, blah, blah, blah. And so my point is that the administrative evaluations are very key, and the administrative evaluations fit into your charter and growth. These are two things that you can use to assess yourselves in the strategic planning process that don't involve personalities and can involve fixing. How do you fix a minimally effective administrator potentially? Have we budgeted for have we budgeted for professional development? Does the you know administrator have the IEP that's required by the statute? You know, what do we have that we're doing and taking into this process that we can use to, 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 to up our game? Um, three years of ineffective ratings, you're gone. You're rated ineffective after three consecutive years. And those are the student growth targets. You have 50% by 1560. If an administrator is regularly involved in instructional matters, um, those goals are required. Now, this is the interesting thing. Sometimes you have a school leader, you just want the school leader to concentrate on instruction. Guess what? That's a two-edged sword, right? <laughs> when you look at that. Um, we want to have clear measures for growth um, and clear measures for evaluations. The reason I'm kind of rocketing through these slides is it talks about administrator evaluations. My teaching point for this is to say that the the administrative evaluation process gives you a framework that you can use and that we all agree upon because it's statutory to say this is how we're going to assess how we work together. This is a part of how we're going to work together. And it's something that should be communicated, um, be in front of the administrator, be in front of the teachers from the administration on down as something that we all either agree to or we all have to do. So when there is an evaluation, the results shouldn't be a surprise. When your charter comes up for renewal, the length of your charter term and the um, length of the, the, the renewal decision on or off shouldn't be a surprise. It should be naturally, you should naturally understand it because you've been through the review of the E360 data that LSSU has not provided. You should understand it because you understand as boards what you've been grappling with. You should understand what the track record is. There shouldn't be any surprises because we've all agreed upon what it's going to look like. I wish I had some thunderous revelation for everybody here to justify you spending two hours listening to me. But um, to me, the thunderous revelation is that agreeing upon standards that are attainable and then, you know, and then working together to meet those standards is the best way to plan because it will keep you on the path to waiting for kids. Um, I'm actually done. Um, so I really appreciate your time today. I did hit you out on time, and I, if any questions you guys have, you can either hang out afterwards or you can ask them now in the plenary session. So thank you guys for your time, and thank you for your support. I have one final thing on behalf of our team um, before I you know, turn over and make close, and that is uh, I am absolutely convinced um, by observing the interaction, the engagement, and most of all the commitment that you are all on your path to greatness and to win for kids. And that's why we're all here. And so to take your weekend to come up here, um, the great work that Nick and his team did to pull all this together, um, I'm just really impressed. And so I think the future is bright for all the kids uh, that we're here for. And uh, Look forward to all those success stories. So thanks for your participation over the last two days. It's been great. I'm going to make the closing comments now, not after lunch, so get on the road. Uh, but first of all, I'd like to thank Joe, Jason, and Julie for their presentations over the last couple of days. Uh, I hope you're able to at least pick one uh, keynote that you're able to take back to your boards and, and share with them. Uh, presentations uh, for uh, Joe today. Uh, we will uh, have access to them. We will mail them, email to all the participants that are here. Uh, we will have the video of the two days, uh, hopefully within the next week or so, on our website. Uh, also, as Joe had indicated, your contracts are on our website. So if you want them, you know, we 
haven't looked at them and had the opportunity to go back and look at your educational goals, uh, please do so. Also, Joe had mentioned about uh, your application, your initial applications uh, for your charter. Uh, if you have not seen those and you would also like to have those, uh, email Jenny or myself and we will get electronically available to you. Uh, next year, we're looking at uh, planning on having regional retreats, one day retreats. And uh, they'll be centrally located. Uh, we might have one in the Detroit area, Grand Rapids area, and Bay City. Or we haven't quite decided. And these will just be one day retreats where you would come for the day. We would have uh, some type of formal presentation, have a meal, and then be on the way. We're looking at possibly doing this for the fall, uh, winter. Uh, also, uh, Jenny will be sending out uh, to you a survey of uh, the two days uh, presentations. Uh, please complete those and send them back to us because then it just gets us information on how we can prepare uh, future. Uh, as I said, uh, lunch we have to go boxes, so if any of you want to get on the road, there's go boxes that you can get your lunch in. Or if you'd like to stay and still visit and have lunch, Thank all of you for coming and hopefully you are able to take some things back to your, your board so you can start sharing. Thank you. Thank you.